Welcome to The Green Rush, a podcast about the business of cannabis. On a weekly basis, hosts Ann Donahoe and Lewis Goldberg talk with the CEOs, politicians, and cultural icons driving the cannabis industry forward. It's been a very busy last month for the legal marijuana industry and movement. Adult use cannabis was just legalized in Canada a few weeks ago on October 17th, which is a day that will go down in history as being very special for all of us, but most especially for our next guest. Today, Ann and Lewis are chatting with Richard Carlton, CEO of the Canadian Securities Exchange, or CSE, a smaller market than its more famous cousin, the Toronto Stock Exchange. A lot of cannabis companies list on the CSE, which is why people half-jokingly call it the Cannabis Stock Exchange and why we think it's the coolest exchange in the world. So don't sit back, lean forward. And now on to some news and then our interview with Richard Carlton, CEO of the Canadian Securities Exchange. Before we get to our interview with Richard Carlton, the CEO of the Cannabis Securities Exchange, we are joined by Deborah Borchardt, who clearly is one of not only our favorite journalists in cannabis, just one of our favorite people in cannabis. Uh, Deb um, created and edits the Green Market Report, uh, Green Market Report, um, and we are recording this on October 26th. And like every week, this has been a big one for cannabis. So, Deb, what is the biggest story of the week? What should we have all been paying attention to? It, it, it's hard to point to one item because really there's a couple. One is just the correction that we've seen in the stocks overall. The overall broader market fell tremendously this week and really entered into correction territory. And as a result, it pulled down a lot of the cannabis stocks with it. Not such a bad thing because we know that they had run up. To me, what I thought was the main item I was watching for this week was the MedMen earnings. I really wanted to see where their numbers were because we really haven't had any hard numbers from MedMen since last year when they put out their prospectus to go public. And that was December 2017 information. We got a little bit of drips and drabs throughout the year. But anyway, um, the numbers came in. They are reporting strong revenue. We're seeing good numbers out of their stores. Their expenses, though, are very high. And this is something that we expected. They were still quite shocking to see. We saw $112 million in losses for the year. That actually came down to a net loss of $66 million. And there's two ways you can look at this. One is that, um, that this is normal in the sense of these are companies that are building, and you would expect to see them pushing that money back into the company. They're having to spend money to go public. They're having to spend money for expensive accountants to go public. They're having to spend money to build properties and acquire properties. So I think that this is a story we're going to see repeated across many companies as they report. And especially as we go further with the Canadian numbers. Canadian uh, market, as you know, just began selling adult-use cannabis. We're going to continue to see companies report record sales. And I think we're going to see that really for the next uh, three quarters. And hopefully the companies will start to tone down their expenses and we'll start to see those numbers normalize. Now, I did mention Canada, and we have gotten trickling of news out of some of the Canadian producers in that the numbers have been very, very good on the first week of sales up in Canada. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Deb. Um, and we'll talk to you again in a couple of weeks. So a big part of this podcast is talking about the stock market in public companies, but very rarely do we get to actually speak with somebody from one of the exchanges about the inner workings of listings and the exchange and, well, how, how to be a publicly traded company. Um, but today we are really lucky because we are speaking with Richard Carlton, the CEO of the Canadian Securities Exchange. So, Richard, thank you so much for coming on with us. We really appreciate you taking the time. It's my pleasure. 
Um, so a lot of our audience is based in the U.S., uh, and they are clearly familiar with the NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange. Um, and probably up until recently, like the last couple of years, they, they might not have been familiar with the with the, the Canadian Securities Exchange. So can you tell us a little bit about, about what you do? Of course. The uh, Canadian Securities Exchange is a 15-year-old startup uh, <laughs> that was uh, put together uh, by... Uh, a group of folks that were uh, and are active in the small cap space in Canada. And uh, it really dates from a time when the uh, Toronto Stock Exchange, which is the, uh, I guess, the Canadian big board, if you want to call it that, uh, acquired the uh, junior capital market, uh, which uh, was formerly operated out of uh, Calgary, Alberta, and Vancouver, British Columbia. And uh, the concern was that uh, you know, with the large exchange having acquired the uh, early stage capital or junior capital market, um, that they weren't necessarily going to be as sensitive to the needs of uh, early stage capital, that they were going to be um, uh, not as uh, cost sensitive uh, to the uh, concerns uh, of these uh, companies. So the Canadian Securities Exchange was really born out of an idea to provide a very efficient, uh, fast um, and uh, cost-effective means for companies to raise capital and access public markets in Canada. So that was about 2003 that the organization started. We've been a recognized stock exchange since 2004. And uh, we've also been uh, like uh, uh, exchange uh, bats in the United States. We've been trading uh, stocks that are listed on other exchanges in Canada for about 10 years now, actually slightly longer than 10 years. And uh, we've been through the whole flash boys, high frequency trading concerns and all of that. But at the same time, uh, we've been continuing to plug away uh, on the uh, small cap space and steadily growing the list of companies that uh, we provide uh, listing services for and uh, opportunities obviously for Canadian investors to participate um, in uh, the growth of these companies by buying and selling the stocks uh, on, on the exchange. So we have been in the PR and IR space for a long time, and at least me personally, I had not heard um, of the CSE up until about three or four years ago, or even two or three years ago. Um, but cannabis has actually kind of changed the the ball game in the U.S. So, do you think cannabis is the best thing that's ever happened to the CSE? Well, certainly, there's there's no doubt that. Um, a big shift in the fortunes of the Canadian Securities Exchange took place in the spring of 2014 hmm. when we had the first of the Canadian um, MMPR, so these are the uh, medical cultivation licenses, uh, began to appear on our doorstep. And uh, uh, I think it's fair to say that they didn't receive the uh, favorable reception that they were hoping for from other exchange providers in uh, Canada. And uh, we took a, uh, an early view, embracing the industry, uh, believing that uh, these uh, companies were, in fact, appropriate vehicles uh, for the public markets. And within a relatively short period of time, um, in sort of the first two quarters of the spring of 2014, we had uh, uh, roughly 30 companies uh, in the cannabis space, uh, exclusively in Canada at that point, but that led to uh, a significant increase in the amount of uh, uh, trading turnover on the exchange, uh, funds raised uh, by uh, companies listed on the exchange, and obviously, you know, in, in terms of the absolute number of companies uh, listed on the exchange. So that was, you know, for us, a real threshold moment. And of course, you know, a couple of years later, we saw the uh, first of the companies that were involved in the United States. And uh, obviously, since then, uh, you know, that that sector uh, of our market has continued to to grow tremendously. So Canada approved medical cannabis back in 2001. And it's funny because I didn't realize that you guys started until 2004. Um, but that was actually the, the, the first year you listed a, a cannabis company. You listed you listed wild. I think it was wildflower brands. Um and then you listed a couple of other ones. I think there was a, a few in 2004, few, um, Wildflower in 2004. You had a couple in 2006 and seven. And, it, and it, the flood didn't start, like you said, until 14. And it really, I mean, the, the floodgates really opened in 16 and 17. But when you listed those first couple of cannabis companies, were you afraid of the risk? 
or, or did you embrace it? I mean, can you t- talk us through the, the thought process on saying, yeah, we're going to, we are going to do what others won't. Yeah, the, the conversation really didn't happen until uh, the spring of 2014. And, and there, I guess there's really two different contexts that it took place. Uh, the first one was, and I'm going to get into a bit of inside baseball here, but, but basically to be listed on an exchange um, with a few exceptions, the company has to be pursuing an active business. And, uh, you know, the, the other, shall we call them the incumbent provider, took a view that a company that was applying for a medical uh, license in Canada w- was not, in fact, uh, pursuing an active business. And uh, so we, we had a, a, a couple of companies uh, who are extremely well known in the industry now. Um, in fact, you know, very large companies in the industry now uh, approach us as they were going through that license application process. And again, it's one of those things that, uh, you know, in retrospect, uh, didn't seem to be much of a conversation at the time. So I was speaking with our head of uh, listings and, and to be blunt, uh, we were scratching our heads as to why the, the concern uh, would be because these were companies that had raised money. Um, they were going through a licensing process with the federal government agency. Uh, the business was, you know, there were no um, concerns as to whether or not uh, uh, they were operating within appropriately within the legal framework because they were. And uh, in order to get off the ground, the companies had to, in fact, build out a uh, cultivation operation, uh, which in Canada, because of our weather, meant that uh, it was an indoor greenhouse operation, uh, complete with HVAC security and a, and a whole bunch of other um, things that they had to build. And uh, so we took a view that, uh, in fact, these companies uh, were in fact pursuing an active business, and uh, that they were uh, that they met the requirements uh, of, of the exchange. And so- as a- and as I said before, um, you know, having gotten a couple of those companies across the, uh, you know, in, into the market, uh, that was a signal to a number of other companies that were similarly situated that uh, they could access public money, they could list on the exchange, and uh, use that as a vehicle to raise further funds uh, as, uh, as as the companies grew. Richard, you may have just answered at least part of our next question here, but um, in the U.S., neither the New York Stock Exchange nor the NASDAQ uh, will will take U.S. plant-touching cannabis companies. Um, uh, what are you guys willing to do that our public markets in the U.S. won't? Specifically, um, you know, the TSX won't, also won't take U.S. plant-touching companies, and you will. I mean, is it this, you know, active market or I, I guess what what are you willing to do that they're not no why why are you willing to do it why are, why are you willing to take this risk well okay so 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 there's there, there are two questions here so you know I, I really addressed the first one and that is whether or not the companies that were pursuing a, a medical um, uh, grow license under the Canadian MMPR regime um, were pursuing an active business so so we answered that question in the positive the next question that came up is, uh, you know, obviously is <laughs> where, where, where we're going with the conversation is, uh, you know, what about companies that were operating in the United States? So by the time we actually had the first companies approach us to list on the exchange who had business interests in the United States, we had uh, a couple of things. Um, the SEC had, in fact, already um, approved uh, a prospectus, uh, you know, prepared and filed by a U.S. company that uh, you know, in, in the U.S. parlance, uh, touch the plant, a uh, cultivator based in uh, Nevada. Similarly, uh, securities regulators in Canada had uh, pro- had had uh, provided receipts, um, which otherwise means approved uh, prospectuses filed by companies with operations in the United States that touch the plant. So, from our perspective, we really need to um, you know look at one critical issue, and that is: is the company operating in accordance with applicable law because we require a positive statement from every company that uh, lists on the exchange that in fact they are going to operate their business in accordance with applicable law. So here we were presented with a number of companies that are operating in a variety of jurisdictions in the United States um, under extremely strict uh, local rules um, and uh, a regulatory regime um, that uh, we felt 
uh, to be blunt, uh, were in fact operating in accordance with the uh, you know the laws that were applicable to them. You know these these organizations were not in fact being subjected to uh, penalties. They weren't being shut down by uh, law enforcement uh, authorities. They were in fact operating completely within the bounds of the regulatory framework for those companies, whether they're cultivators. Extractors, consumer packagers, uh, logistics folks, retailers, pharma companies, what have you. So we were comfortable uh, with the uh, representations that were being provided by all of these issuers that they were being um, that they were in effect uh, operating in accordance with uh, applicable law. Now we have also uh, very clear guidance in Canada uh, from the Securities Commissions, uh, as well as our own exchange. Um, uh, direction to the companies on the type of disclosure that they have to provide to us both when they list and then through the course of their uh, life as a public company uh, on the in, with a particular focus on the legal risks of operating and the potential impact on the company uh, if in fact they uh, fall afoul of the uh, legal framework that they're operating under. So we, as I say we felt very comfortable um, that uh, with that disclosure framework in place, um, that uh, we were in fact in a position to, uh, to to provide listing services to these companies. So how many, let's talk numbers for a second. It looks like there's more, uh, probably well more than 100 listed cannabis companies. How many of them are in the U.S.? And are you do you guys just have an incredible backlog, um, you know, as the only exchange that's that's willing to do this at the moment? We have uh, approximately 110 companies, uh, which is about 25% of our issuers uh, in the cannabis space at this point uh, in general. And of that number, uh, about 45 uh, have business operations in the United States. Uh, and that includes, of course, uh, companies that are Canadian domicile that may have investments in the United States, or it may be companies that, in fact, are uh, incorporated in the United States and are operating uh, in uh, one of the states where cannabis is legal, either for medical or recreational purposes, or both. And and what overall percentage is our cannabis companies? I mean, you, there's the joke that you guys that the CSE is stands for the Cannabis Stock Exchange. Um, <laughs> what's the percentage of your business? It's not a very cannabis. funny joke. By the way, it's not a very funny joke. <laughs> and I tell bad jokes, and that was not a funny joke. I, it's not my joke. I didn't make it up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not claiming credit for that. Uh, no, it's, uh, we, we, we've heard it before. And uh, actually, you know, the, the jokes actually don't get old. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, you know, one of those guys been smoking is, uh, you know, it's particularly good one uh, in almost any context. Well, you've already said to be blunt a couple times, and it's made yeah, a giggle. Yeah, I know, I know, but uh, <laughs> yeah, and that was entirely unintentional. Um, but uh, in <laughs> in any event, uh, you know, I, I talked about uh, you know about half of the, the cannabis companies uh, are uh, have some kind of uh, interest in the uh, U.S. Uh, cannabis business, either uh, medical or recreational. From a market capitalization perspective, uh, the, the percentage is uh, significantly higher than that. Um, I, I think, you know, the last time I checked, it was uh, approximately 60, 65 percent of the capitalization of the exchange. And, you know, that that is uh, uh, principally a result of the uh, newer companies uh, with interest in the United States who tend to be larger, uh, more mature uh, than the newly listed Canadian companies that we saw a few years ago. Um, so these companies tend to be uh, in revenue. Uh, some of them are actually profitable. And uh, they are, in many cases, uh, fully integrated, uh, you know, seed-to-store type operations where, um, again, they're not just simply cultivators, uh, but they are, um, you know, engaged, uh, you know, right up to and including the, uh, the, the retail component of the business. So a lot of the company, look, uh, American companies are looking to access the capital markets and they're, they are blocked from doing so um, in the U.S. And on your exchange, they're going through what's called an RTO or a, a reverse takeover. Um, so my question, my question is, um, so why are they doing this? Why are the companies using an RTO with you and, and buying currently existing companies' shells versus doing a more traditional IPO? 
Well, the reverse takeover is actually the most common way for um, Canadian companies of all kinds to access the public markets in Canada. You know, one of the big differences between, uh, you know, the listed world in Canada and the United States is that we have a very, very active uh, junior capital space. And that comes from our background as, uh, uh, you know, an economy that supports uh, a tremendous amount of uh, mining and oil and gas exploration in the public markets. And so what you'll see, and as I say, this goes on, you know, this, this goes back generations uh, in the markets, is uh, companies that, um, you know, for example, would go out, uh, raise uh, 8 to $12 million to uh, investigate uh, the mineral uh, potential of a particular property, and uh, if they, in fact, don't succeed, don't find anything of uh, commercial interest, what will often happen is uh, uh, folks with a private company, uh, whether it's a mining company, oil and gas exploration company, technology company, whatever, uh, will, will look to use that existing public vehicle uh, through a reverse takeover. So the private company will, in fact, acquire the existing public company in order to um, secure that uh, listing on the exchange. Typically when that happens, uh, the private company will uh, at the same time, contemporaneously with the listing, uh, raise uh, often through a private placement as opposed to a broad distribution of securities uh, uh, using a prospectus, but they'll raise um, uh, private money uh, from a relatively small number of shareholders um, in order to fund the next uh, uh, development of the uh, of, of the company. Um, this is actually a fairly common technique in the United States in the small cap space. Uh, uh, you know, the uh, U.S. investment bankers tend to refer to it as reverse merger as opposed to reverse takeover. But um, as I say, this is not at all uh, an unusual type of transaction. In fact, the, over the last few years in Canada, uh, it's probably 85 or 90 percent of the companies that have come into the market do so by way of the reverse takeover. So let's talk contingency. What happens if Canada, um, I'm sorry, what happens if the U.S. deschedules or reschedules cannabis? You know, you guys have become this locus for the global cannabis markets and you you have this this strong foothold on the market itself. But, but what happens on the day that... Um, that we basically clear the way for the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ to, to take companies that have traditionally turned to the CSE. How are you preparing for that? Yeah, well, I guess, uh, you know, let me let you in on a, a dirty secret of the exchange business. Um, yes, we love dirty secrets. <laughs> companies uh, are actually a lot more portable uh, than trading. So what I mean by that is, uh, in fact, right now we have about 225 Canadian companies that are listed on the New York Stock Exchange or on NASDAQ. Okay, so these are you know big, big Canadian companies that uh, have decided that they want to be able to raise money, access uh, U.S. Uh, investors uh, to improve the overall liquidity profile of the stock uh, by listing on, on New York or, or on the NASDAQ. And what happens is the percentage of trading that takes place in Canada and the percentage of trading that takes place in the United States is almost always exactly the same as the percentage of the residents of the shareholders. Okay, so if 20% of the stock is held by U.S. residents, then 20% of the trading will happen in the United States. So, and, and there isn't, as an exchange operator, and you know, I, I hate to admit it, but I've been in this business now for almost 30 years. Um, there isn't really much the exchange can do uh, to, uh, in effect, win back market share or build a higher market share or, or whatever. It's really all about where the shareholders are resident. Now, let me tell you, though, um, we do, in fact, in order to um, allow uh, companies that have U.S. shareholders now or want to build uh, additional U.S. shareholders or mind share in the United States, we actually encourage them to um, obtain a quotation on one of the regulated boards operated by the U.S. OTC Markets Group because um, it's important uh, for these companies, especially the ones with uh, you know, their, their roots and their operations in the United States, to be able to provide uh, liquidity for their early stage investors, their officers, directors, employees, friends, family, you know, everybody who's been involved in the stock, um, to be able to trade. Uh, on their Schwab account, Ameritrade, 
E-Trade, Fidelity, you know, one of, one of the discount brokers. And uh, they're able to do that. As a, as a Canadian reporting issuer, uh, in effect, they automatically qualify uh, for that uh, quotation. You have a substantial amount of cross-border arbitrage between Canada and the United States. So what that means is that if the U.S. market maker on the OTC kind of falls asleep and doesn't uh, quote a market that reflects the market that's on, on the Canadian Securities Exchange, for example, um, the arbitrage trading guys will go in and absolutely smoke the uh, uh, market maker in, uh, in New York. Well, and therefore, and they're also going to be smoking the the retail U.S. investor, right? I mean, that's that's what's happening. It's a professional guy going. There's an inefficiency in the market. I'm going to exploit it. Well, it's actually the market maker who is the one making. You know, they're they're the one making the market. So it's not a continuous auction market. So it's not the case where um, you know the ARBs are trading with uh, retail who are in a book like Nasdaq or New York maintains. In fact, when you look at the OTC markets uh, market, you're actually trading with uh, uh, Citadel and Virtu and Canaccord and E-Trade and, and some of the other big market making firms. So, as I say, it's actually the it, it, it's the pros who get smoked <laughs> under these circumstances. There's so much smoking going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> really? Yep. I did it. I did it. I'm not sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So, so you're explaining why why you've got a walled garden against the U.S., but what about the TSX, right? Because it wasn't too long ago that you and the TSX were doing these listings, and then they said, no, 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 we're not going to touch the U.S. We're 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 not going to take American companies that are violating federal law, and that gave you a monopoly. But what happens if tomorrow the TSX goes, eh, there's a lot of listing fees here. Let's get them. Then what happens? Well, that'll be uh, an interesting day. I mean, the uh, obviously the interesting component is uh, uh, membership in the uh, Canadian Benchmark Index. But as U.S. companies, uh, the U.S. cannabis issuers actually aren't eligible to join the equivalent of the Canadian S&P 500, if you want to call it that. So uh, I, I hope that we've uh, built... Uh, sufficient uh, customer loyalty, brand identification, access, and all of those uh, things that exchanges uh, strive to uh, provide to their issuers. That uh, you know, we 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 we've built that uh, I guess that brand loyalty. Um, you know, really, if you want to uh, look back some years, uh, you know, Nasdaq uh, made their name uh, as the place where the technology companies uh, went from startups to you know behemoth companies. And, uh, you know, when the New York Stock Exchange uh, called up uh, Bill Gates uh, way back in the day and said, you know, Bill, uh, it's time for you to leave this uh, NASDAQ thing, uh, you know, he uh, told them to get lost. Uh, I believe, in fact, his language was a little bit more colorful than that. <laughs> yeah. You, you mean he said, go fuck yourself? Uh, I, I don't know, but uh, rumor, rumor <laughs> suggests that that's perhaps what he told them. Uh, in, in any event, uh, you know, we, we want to be in that position. Um, and, uh, you know, we're obviously working closely with these, uh, issuers, uh, to, uh, you know, that if, as, and when that day happens, uh, that they will have a similar reaction to the, uh, uh, to the other guys, if they do in fact go knocking on their doors. So we're recording this on, um, October 26th, October 26th, um, yes. which, <laughs> which is a week after, uh, October 17th, which is the legalization um, in Canada. So how has that affected uh, your business? What has the last week been like for you, or has it been business as usual? Um, it, it has been an interesting week. I mean, the, uh, you know, one, one of the tired old saws in the uh, equity investment world is, uh, you know, buy on rumor, sell on news. Uh, and there's no doubt. Which, which has happened. Oh, boy. Yeah, there. There, there, there has been a, uh, you know, within the sector itself, uh, there were certainly a couple of uh, days of uh, significant selling pressure. Um, it whipsawed back towards the end of the week last week. Um, now, of course, we're, you know, obviously been in a significant market. Uh, uh, you know, I sound like some talking head on BNN or, or CNBC or something here, but, uh, you know, significant market downdraft. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we have been in a, in a, in a, in a material sell-off in the broader market. And that's uh, obviously affected the, uh, you know, all of the sectors, uh, including the cannabis space. So what, you know, when the, when the when the market has a big sell-off, is there anything that the exchange can do to help support 
the the stocks or is it guys we're just facilitating well i mean the uh, you know the joke is of course that you know we don't care whether the market is up or down as long as people trade um <laughs> <laughs> and you know again let, let, let's let, let's sort of take a step back here um it, it's a new industry. There are a lot of new entrants. There's an awful lot of speculation that takes place, which uh, you know can lead in in you know instances to uh, valuations which get ahead of themselves or whatever you want to call it. That said, uh, this is a real business. You know, we we are taking something that is uh, and and has been a relatively well organized black market operation, bringing it into um, you know the legitimate business circles. There will be earnings. There will be profits. Um, you know, there will be uh, significant businesses and fortunes created as a result of uh, the legalization of the cannabis uh, industry in North America. I, we we know that this is true. So uh, obviously, there's a you know a, a lot of uh, a lot of speculation in terms of uh, who the winners are going to be. Um, you know, and what parts of the industry are likely to be the most profitable, command the largest margins and so on. And that's really what, you know, markets are all about, to, to price risk and to basically, uh, you know, in, in some respects, it's the ultimate expression of democracy. It's a war of ideas, uh, you know, battled on a, on a real-time basis uh, with a lot of different participants and a lot of money in, at stake. Um, and, uh, you know, eventually we get to... Uh, uh, you know, we, we, we get to a good place. So one of our favorite guests is a guy named Alan Brockstein, who I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, and he predicted that 2017, or 2000, I'm sorry, 2018, not 17. I'm clearly, I'm losing it here, but, um, but this year would see a, a wave of M and a, and we've started to see that in the cannabis space. Um, but, over the years, and especially over the last decade, we've seen a tremendous amount of consolidation amongst amongst exchanges. ICE has been really acquisitive. You, you've got others that are out there that are you know building and buying. Um, you know the U.S. exchanges are losing a tremendous amount of money in listing fees to you, to to London, to to others. Um, so, any of them sniffing around you guys? Or are we going to see a, a consolidation amongst the Canadian exchanges anytime soon? Well, here, here's another dirty secret about the exchange business. Although I appreciate the last one wasn't all that dirty. This one isn't <laughs> all that dirty either, sorry. But, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the cross-border uh, industry consolidation hasn't really worked. Uh, and the reason is that the types of synergies that you're looking for when, uh, you know, in the, in the broader corporate world when you do when you do mergers and acquisitions activity, um, don't don't necessarily work all that well in the exchange business because each uh, jurisdiction that you're operating in is different enough that um, you know the kinds of technical and operations and GNA and you know all of that stuff that you normally look for uh, doesn't happen. Uh, and so when, when you saw uh, ICE buy up. Uh, you know, Euronext, and of course, Euronext itself was the creature of the Paris Bourse uh, going crazy and buying, uh, you know, five or six or seven or eight exchanges in, uh, in, in the continent and so on. Um, those transactions, as I say, have not, uh, uh, you know, provided the types of returns that uh, uh, management had, uh, had expected. Now, um, you know, our... Uh, you know, some of the, the, the folks that, uh, that I've worked with here are, you know, are... Uh, both of our chairs, uh, since I've been CEO, uh, you know, lead investors and all of that. Look, it's like any other business. You keep your head down. Uh, you do your job on a day in, day out basis. You try to do the best that you can for your customers, uh, for your employees. Um, and uh, you know, if opportunities arise, well, you know, that'll that'll happen. It'll kind of take care of itself. But uh, you know, at the, for the time being, we're just trying to be the best exchange we can be. Uh, for issuers, and uh, you know, we happen to be obviously catching a significant wave with the uh, U.S. cannabis industry at this point, and uh, we're obviously delighted to be able to work with these folks. That was perfectly said. I mean, that that was like, as a PR guy, I'm proud of you. That was wonderful. <laughs> Good job, Richard. Yes, well done. <laughs> and, I, and I didn't use lust or longing in any way, shape. <laughs> 
my response. Uh, yeah, but there was no, but there was no dirty secret in there either. I mean, it's you know, you know, we're we waiting. Need we're waiting to for the re- fine dirty little. Secret no, here. no, I got it. We have a question coming up that's definitely going to st- pull out maybe a, maybe a dirty secret. So. Well, I don't. It's not going to be my next one. No, I don't think. I don't well, think so either. It, 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 well, it's kind of based on the consolidation that we were just talking about before. Let's, you know, to to take a left turn. We're seeing a lot within the industry with, you know, MP, MPX and Ianthus and Medman, Medman and Pharmacan. Uh, are you? What's your view on this? Do you think this is going to accelerate? Do you think, um, you know, uh, people are going to be snapping each other up for the next six months and then it's going to even out? Do you have a? a viewpoint on that yeah i I think this is going to be spectacular uh in terms of the amount of uh, of uh further investment opportunities and 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 m&a activities uh clearly uh you know we're, we're, we're seeing now with you know just slightly more than a week under our belts in canada uh supply shortages uh supply chain issues uh challenges at the retail level and you know, people are going to look to um, uh, address uh, a number of those things. I think through uh, through M and A activity, absolutely going to be a, a big part of it. Similarly, the United States, we we haven't even scratched the surface of of what's going on. I mean, we're seeing the you know the pioneers, the early stage uh, and aggressive folks uh, hit the public markets, get valuation, get. Um, uh, currency that they can use in M and A transactions, um, and 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 they can look for you know both opportunities uh, you know to uh, broaden uh, the business horizontally or expand vertically, uh, to basically uh, you know achieve the types of synergies that uh, people look for in traditional M and A, and of course we haven't even talked about what you know the the big one is, and that is you know big pharma, big tobacco, big uh, liquor. Uh, showing up and uh, basically saying, look, you know, we, we, we need to have, uh, a, you know, a, a cannabis portfolio as part of our overall consumer products offering uh, or, um, you know, cannabis uh, products as part of our uh, pharma offerings, whether that's uh, over-the-counter medications or whether it's uh, uh, prescription-based uh, medications. And, you know, we, we've obviously seen uh, a few... You know, the, the Constellation uh, investment in Canopy was obviously, I think, a watershed uh, for the industry. But, you know, that that's one transaction. And then there are clearly going to be many, many, many more uh, as, uh, as as we move out. Now, of course, the question is, you know, when is that going to happen? Um, you know, obviously, I don't know. I wouldn't have predicted that the Constellation investment uh, in, in Canopy was a 2017-2018 story. I would have guessed that, that was going to be a, a, a later story, but, uh, uh, you know, there's no doubt, and, and I think we all know and accept that uh, just about every consumer products uh, company is, uh, has at a minimum a watching brief uh, in the cannabis industry, and, you know, some of them are actively preparing plans to uh, obviously invest in the space directly. So, so that brings me to my next question. We know... Um, that there are a slew of some really big RTOs in the offing in the next both weeks and months. Are there any ones that you are really excited about? <laughs> or let me let me pick yeah, your like, favorite we, children. Yeah, Richard. yeah, pick your favorite child. Do you like? The, I, I was going right there. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, you're asking me if I love any of my children more than the others. Uh, you know, and uh, you know the the, the answer is. You know, we're obviously pleased with each and every company that uh, that, that chooses to join. Uh, you know, the organization, whether it's uh, through a reverse takeover uh, or uh, initial public offering. Um, you know, for us, uh, I mentioned at the outset, uh, we've been at this 15 years now, um, and we felt uh, a few times, especially over the first half of our existence, that uh, perhaps we were banging our heads against the wall a little bit. Uh, and that nobody was paying attention to us, or uh, that uh, you know maybe maybe we weren't on the right track. So to see the situation turn uh, to where we've got uh, companies with valuations uh, in the multiple billions of dollars uh, that uh, that we're having the privilege of working with uh, is is so gratifying, uh, you know, for for us on a personal level um, and uh, you know collectively as an organization. 
uh, you know, it really does validate all of the things that we believed uh, the Canadian Securities Exchange uh, represented and the services that we could deliver. And, uh, you know, it is uh, obviously a, uh, you know, it's a very gratifying uh, period of time for us. So you've seen hundreds and hundreds of companies list, either through an initial offering or an RTO, whatever. Um, can you, you know, there are probably potentially hundreds of companies listening to us talk right now. If you could tell them the three biggest mistakes to avoid in preparing for a listing, like when you see a company doing this, you're like, oh, shit, they're going down the wrong path. Like, what are the things that they need to be aware of and avoid? Well, it, you know, it's funny that you mentioned three things because, uh, you know, there's a, it, it's like that real estate joke about, you know, the three things that matter, location, location, location. Um, you know, in investment banking circles, the uh, the joke is the three things that matter are the cap table, the cap table, and the cap table. <laughs> so, um, and and again, you know, unfortunately for, you know, maybe retail investors, uh, you know, this may be kind of uh, deep inside, uh, you know, analytic uh, baseball. But... Um, Companies need to present uh, a cap table which is both, um, you know, friendly. Hold on, hold on. Can you? Some of our people, some of our listeners, may not know what a cap table is. Can you just take a quick moment and explain that? And 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 again, you're you're absolutely right to call me up on that one. But yeah, so the capitalization table. So it's it's what shares do you have outstanding? Do you have multiple classes of securities? Do they have different rights or privileges? Uh, from, uh, you know, other classes of securities that have been issued. You know, generally speaking, um, you know, the, the capitalization tables that are friendliest to the equity markets and the ones that produce the greatest uh, liquidity outcomes are the simplest ones, uh, where there's a relatively large amount of stock out that, you know, is available to, to be bought and sold, um, that uh, you don't see an awful lot of... Uh, Pre -pub, you know, before the company was public, that the founders uh, gave themselves a whole bunch of cheap stock, right? That that's not a um, that's not a capitalization table that investment bankers like, and it's not one that uh, retail investors should like. Um, you know, they should be looking at uh, uh, management teams who have basically, you know, paid if not full freight, then close to full freight uh, for the uh, for the equity that they hold in the company, uh, for example. So, so those are the sorts of uh, things that uh, you know people, uh, you know, should be looking at when evaluating the different investment opportunities and understanding, you know, what is what 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 is this common share that I'm uh, potentially uh, purchasing uh, in the secondary market uh, through the facilities of the Canadian Securities Exchange. So, and then on the other side, um, for if I'm a CEO of a public company and I'm I'm going to prepare for this experience, you know. Uh, you know, how is it, how, what, what should they avoid? You know, is it, is it on the banking side? Is it on, you know, when they're doing their road show? Like if you were to talk to a CEO of a, a company and they're thinking about listing on the, the, the CSE, what are the biggest mistakes that they can avoid? Well, as I say, the, um, I, and I, and I've already talked about it, um, in something that investors are looking at, but that is, you know, having, uh, you know, too much of the company held by the insiders uh, that they didn't necessarily pay uh, full freight, right? That they basically gave themselves a bunch of cheap stock um, and which serves as something of an overhang uh, over, the, uh, uh, over the company. Um, you know, that, that's a big mistake that we see. And, and, you know, complicated capitalization tables with multiple different instruments, different rights and privileges and so on for the different classes of securities. Again, you know, we understand why people do that, uh, but it, uh, you know, can certainly complicate the investment uh, uh, process uh, when third parties are looking at, uh, uh, at the company. The other thing, and, and, and this is, you know, across the board for every company that lists, you know, uh, so many uh, companies, uh, you know, regard the, the the day they list as kind of the that's the finish line. You know, they scored the goal, they went public, and the reality is, no, 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 that that's actually just the start uh, of a uh, you know a, a requirement effectively to engage in a significant communications effort, investor relations effort, whatever you want to call it, um, in order to continue to communicate the unique value proposition of the company to the marketplace.
And thank you for that plug for yeah, hiring KCSA. Yes. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you. Uh, and again, I'm not just, uh, I, I appreciate that, you know, I am literally preaching to the choir here, but um, it, 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 it's absolutely true that, uh, uh, you know, the company is going to realize the value uh, of the investment they've made in going public. Uh, you know, they really do have to uh, engage in a responsible, uh, you know, communications program uh, with the broader market, uh, you know, with a view to, uh, you know, communicating that uh, that unique story. Love it. Um, so this question isn't really about um, the CSE. It's more about uh, the drama that has been created about uh, borders and it's our fault and, you know, we're sorry. Um, <laughs> but U.S. Customs has been stopping Canadians involved in the in the cannabis industry from crossing the border into the U.S. And it hasn't been a ton of people. And, you you know, we were saying earlier that we all know someone who knows someone. Um, are you concerned about traveling to the U.S.? Well, uh, you know, it's certainly been a point of... Um uh, nervousness for people involved in the in the organization uh, or in, in in the industry rather. Um, the you know U.S. border services have uh, you know from my perspective said nothing more than what the law of the United States is. Uh, you know in response to to questions you know that if you you know concede that you've committed felony offenses and all of that sort of thing that uh, you're not welcome to uh, cross the border into the United States. So, you know, again, that, that, that's not a surprising or, you know, particularly uh, controversial uh, position to take. Um, you know, certainly uh, lots of companies in Canada, whether they're investment dealers, law firms, accounting firms, uh, uh, invest, investor relations and PR firms, yep. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, have been uh, talking to their employees about, uh, you know, the, the kinds of things that uh, they, you know, should and shouldn't say if they do in fact find themselves being uh, subject to secondary uh, review uh, by U.S. border services. Um, you know, I think obviously the, uh, you know, the baseline is don't lie, um, you know, whatever you, <laughs> whatever the situation is, because if you do, um, e even if they, you know, you were being held back inappropriately or other mistakes were made, uh, you know, you're, uh, you're, you're cooked. Um, but, uh, you know, I, Obviously, lots and lots of the people involved in the industry in Canada, fully legal in Canada, aren't you know going to the United States to play golf, visit relatives, uh, you know, go to the beach in Florida, whatever. Um, you know, uh, I believe we've had some clarity uh, from U.S. Border Services recently that uh, that those people, in fact, will not be uh, prevented from entering the United States. There's uh, obviously a bit of a gray area where you've got uh, folks who are actually going to the United States uh, to work with uh, folks uh, uh, in the uh, in the business in the United States, and uh, as I say, we'll see you know how how things develop there. Um, I, again, I mean, I, I'm I'm hopeful uh, that the uh, legislative agenda in the United States will advance um, following the midterm elections uh, to provide more clarity on um you know what the uh, what the rules uh, of the road are effectively um and i know that there are a number of pieces of competing legislation in front of both houses at this point uh to to do just that um and so as i say we'll we'll see but uh, you know my my suspicion is that uh, uh, you know a lot of these issues are going to be cleared up um, you know probably sooner rather than later so um, we are at just about 40, 40 minutes or so, and we want to be respectful of your time. So we got one more question for you. Um, we call it while you were sleeping. So if you can just tell us one thing that the public or the press is missing when it comes to covering cannabis. It's like the one story that you wish you were reading either in the Globe and Mail or the Wall Street Journal. Like, what are we all missing? <laughs> you know, that's I, I, here. Here's. I, I guess I would answer it this way, um, not having had a chance to think it uh, through, unlike the other questions. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no worries. It's uh, it's fair baseball. Um, I, I think it's this. You know, when people think about the industry, you know, again, whether it's in Canada or the United States, uh, you know, the focus is very much on, uh, you know, the, the recreational market. You know, basically people, you know, instead of having a, a couple of scotches after work, uh, you know, instead uh, partake of, uh, you know, some 
cannabis uh, delivery vehicle. Um, you know, friends of mine in the business refer to it as the mind release market. Um, I obviously get, have the privilege of uh, traveling, uh, you know, around the world and talking to some of the leading researchers and folks in the space. And my suspicion uh, is that, in fact, that that is going to be far from the biggest piece of the market when we, you know, when we're five or ten years out. Um, I think that the potential, and and perhaps I'm saying this because I was in Israel last week. Uh, talking to a number of folks that, uh, um, and, and I think it's generally understood in the in the industry that uh, the Israelis have done the most advanced uh, research in terms of uh, uh, therapeutic uh, uh, application of uh, of cannabis and cannabinoids and uh, and, and related compounds to, to various uh, 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 health issues. I, I think that's going to be far and away a bigger part of the market. Uh, than, than anybody grasps or, or, or understands at this point. And, you know, anecdotally, I, I actually, you know, see it. Um, you know, I, I like to play golf every now and then. I belong to a golf course. And, you know, most of the guys are a little bit older. A bunch of them are retired. And the number of them that have been uh, uh, basically using cannabis products over the last two, three, four, five years uh, for pain relief, anti-inflammatory purposes, uh, you know, prostate-related issues, uh, and, and this is, you know, at this point, self-medicating sort of thing. It just just absolutely blows my mind. And, uh, you know, there, there has to be something there, and I think, you know, again, and particularly out of Israel, the preliminary research suggests that, in fact, there are many uh, very powerful applications of uh, of uh, you know cannabinoid and, and, and THC related uh, uh, compounds to to a variety of uh, ailments. As I say, I think that that's actually the story that people are missing. Uh, it's not about, uh, as I say, going home on Friday night and uh, you know relaxing after a long week. Um, I think uh, we're going to see you know both the uh, prescription and over the counter medications which have uh, cannabis related uh, compounds involved with them. Uh, be, in fact, a significantly larger part of the market. That was awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. We really appreciated it. Um, it was it was exactly what we hoped, which was a mix between a really in-depth conversation about the structure and how markets work and, you know, and making what you guys are doing accessible. So we really, really appreciate you taking the time with us. No problem. And uh, not a single F-bomb except from your side. <laughs> <laughs> And we also didn't make you give us stock picks. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, right. We're more likely to get an F bomb out of it. <laughs> Thanks to Richard Carlton, the CEO of the Canadian Securities Exchange. For more information, check them out at thecse.com. As always, if you want to chat with us, you can find us on Instagram and Twitter with the handle at KCSA underscore cannabis, uh, or drop us an email at greenrush at kcsa.com. And don't forget to subscribe. I want more hate mail. <laughs> Lewis does love him some hate mail. Okay, one take, Shay. One take. <laughs>